for their benefit. Dr. Slayman. Thank you very much. Uh, I apologize that I'm not on the stage with my colleagues. Uh, I'm moving a little slow at this meeting because of uh, an injury to my uh, leg, but um, I want to uh, and acknowledge the ACR people and the San Antonio meeting people for accommodating me for all these uh, challenges. Uh, we'll talk about this uh, trial, which was a large adjuvant trial that looked at a combination of the chemotherapy Herceptin regimens that have been approved, plus or minus uh, bevacizumab as an antiangiogenic. Um, I'll have to have somebody else advance the slide. Next slide. Um, everyone here knows the HER2 alteration. I won't belabor this slide. It's well traveled. Uh, we were fortunate enough in 1987 to first identify this alteration and say that it defined a new subgroup of breast cancer, which is between 20 to 25 percent of the global burden of breast cancer of about uh, 1.7 million uh, cases per year. So about 20 to 25 percent will have this alteration. It's a non-inherited alteration that plays a role in driving pathogenesis. Uh, and is associated with uh, among the poorest outcomes. Next slide. Um, the rationale for the study was that in preclinical studies, um, this uh, drug, uh, this alteration was associated with the increased growth and proliferation, as well as increases in neoangiogenesis and VEGF production. And that was shown by our lab as well as other laboratories uh, around, the, uh, around the world. Um, there are decreases in differentiation, combinations of preclinical models indicated that this might be a rational strategy, and there is a correlation between high levels of HER2 and as well as high levels of VEGF with prognosis. So they were independent prognostic predictors, and together they predict even worse outcome. Uh, there are clinical information from non-randomized small trials. So these are um, uh, trials that uh, need to be interpreted as, uh, as being a, a signal finding and, and will generate further trials, and we had some data with phase 1b, uh, in phase 1b, showing that in metastatic breast cancer, uh, the combination of an anti-HER2 therapeutic trastuzumab and bevacizumab uh, had objective responses that were without chemotherapy that uh, were very encouraging. And there were about 50 patients in that trial. Based on that information, we were able to uh, d design the next slide, the trial that we'll show you. This is the most complicated slide I'll show you. I promise no more complicated than this. The trial design entered uh, 3,500 uh, patients over, just over that. Uh, next click. Um, there are two cohorts. One cohort was using the TCH backbone uh, for her trastuzumab, H being the trastuzumab receptin, TC being docetaxel and carboplatin. Uh, we had done preclinical work and uh, had done the 006 study that showed that this was an active regimen and it was approved by both the FDA and the EMEA as a uh, therapeutic. One of the things we found attractive about it was that it got around the one problem that Herceptin causes for women uh, when used in combination with anthracycline, and that's the cardiac dysfunction, which occurs in a small but a defined number of patients, uh, including congestive heart failure. Uh, the stratification are shown here in terms of number of positive nodes, hormone receptor status, and the geographic site. When the patients were given this backbone, they were then randomized to either receive bevacizumab plus the backbone or not. The second cohort, uh, next click, uh, was to ask the same question with an anthracycline-based therapy. There was a very robust discussion at the design of this trial. Uh, from some of our colleagues, both in the U.S. and in Europe, that anthracyclines must be used for this disease um, because of what we sort of have learned over the last decades in the meta-analyses. So we designed this. Uh, uh, there are a number of sites, uh, about 170 independent sites, that were given the option to either use TCH or an anthracycline-based regimen. We had assumed, based on what we were told, that many would go with the uh, anthracycline-based regimen, FEC, uh, with uh, uh, docetaxel and trastuzumab given up front, and then again Herceptin for a year afterwards. Uh, in fact, more than half elected to use TCH. So we have a small number that were in this cohort, just under 300. Uh, they were randomized to have plus or minus BEV. So again, that's the most complicated slide. I'll show you that's the trial design. Next slide. Um, the primary objective was, th would there be a difference in invasive disease-free survival? Uh, and the secondary endpoints are shown here. Next slide. 
Um, we needed 296 events to be able to uh, detect an 85% uh, power to detect a hazard ratio of 0.7, which would be significant. Next slide. Um, how did we come up with the assumptions that would show a difference? Well, we had the experience from the trial that you know about, the BCRG006 trial, that first tested the TCH regimen. And at three years, next slide, click again, uh, for the uh, TCH arm, there was an 86% disease-free survival. Next click. For the anthracycline arm at the three-year point, it was 87%. These were not statistically significant. They were numerically different. With further follow-up, they split a little bit more, but were never statistically significantly different. And there was more toxicity in the anthracycline-based arm in terms of cardiac dysfunction, as was anticipated. Next click. But we were looking at TCH, so we benchmarked the data we had. There were 1,000 patients treated in the BCRG trial on the TCH regimen. Next slide. Uh, the trial, Beth, was well balanced for patient characteristics. It's shown here. It's in your slide deck. I won't belabor it, but it was balanced for all the major parameters, including stratified for a number of positive nodes. There is a significant difference here in that we have more node positive disease in this trial than we had in other trials. Uh, the BCRG006 and the HERA trials had about 30% node negative. We're up to about 48% node negative in this, but there was big enough that we had uh, enough node positive that we could stratify for that. And you see the other strata shown here. Next slide. The efficacy data, next slide. There it is. Um, that is about as, as negative as you'll get uh, in terms of outcome, in terms of bevacizumab adding anything. The surprise here came with the fact that in a study that was more than three times larger uh, than the 006 trial, we had an, uh, a disease-free survival rate at, at uh, over three years, 38 months, of 92%. So it was taking longer to accrue the event, so we thought something may be going on. Um, and then when we saw the data, we were uh, struck by this, uh, this improvement. This is the uh, primary endpoint. Uh, next slide is the overall survival data. There are very few events here. Again, good news for patients, uh, but a very high overall survival rate at the 38-month e uh, median uh, time point. Next slide. Um, here are the forest plots by subgroup. Um, you can see with regards to age, uh, race, and the geographic distribution, there's very little difference. There was a bit of a trend uh, in some areas of the world, but um, those uh, forest plots cross one, so they are not statistically significant. But all the rest are pretty much dead on center. The next slide uh, indicates the forest plots for the strata that we mentioned. Um, and here you see by positive non nodes, node negative, versus one to three nodes versus greater than four nodes, all groups divide, uh, derive a very significant benefit uh, from uh, the treatment in terms of the 92% uh, being uh, the benchmark. So 92% was the combined thing. It was higher in the node negatives, lower in the node positives, but all were pretty much the same without BEV adding anything and the TCH regimen being pretty good in all groups. Um, you can see for uh, hormone receptor status, um, whether you're ER, uh, PR negative or positive, um, there is a trend in almost all the trials that show some difference, but that is not confirmed in Beth. Um, they all have this significant benefit that uh, with the TCH regimen, again, not deriving any benefit by the addition of bevacizumab, uh, not deriving any additional benefit. And then you see the data for tumor size. I'm sorry this has moved a bit, but uh, you can get uh, the idea where those forest plots should be. Next slide. Um, this is the secondary endpoint by treatment cohort. This is the TCH uh, data. Again, overall, it's right on target at 92% for TCH or TCHB. Um, and for the anthracycline-based arm, and these data should be interpreted with the fact that there was only just under 300 patients in that arm. Next slide. Um, it's not statistically significantly different. It's a little numerically less different, but it's certainly not superior to what we saw with TCH, uh, as some had, had uh, speculated maybe uh, from the past. Uh, next slide, the safety, next slide. The adverse events of interest, next. Uh, go ahead and click again. 
Uh, in terms of all AE, grade four, three, four AEs, and I'll give more definition of that in the presentation later, but hypertension was much uh, higher in the bevacizumab arm. This is an on-target known effect of antiangiogenic therapy, and we certainly saw it in Beth. Next click. Uh, in terms of bleeding and the incidence of congestive heart failure, again, um, there was a trend for CHF and clearly a difference in bleeding. And finally, for proteinuria and gastrointestinal perforations, uh, again, the bevacizumab arm had more. So the addition of Bev didn't add any efficacy, but certainly added some safety uh, concerns. Next slide. Um, how do the Beth data compare to uh, the existing results of all the large regimens that have been uh, seen? Here, the slide is different than what you have in your deck. There are a couple errors in the one you have in your deck, so this is the right one. Next slide, but it's very similar. Uh, go, I'm sorry, go back. Um, Beth has shown extreme left. Uh, the B31 NSABP trial and the N9831 are shown here. So for all patients, uh, the uh, chemo plus receptin arm is at 92% at 38 months. We're comparing 38 months to the three-year points that were reported for all these trials. Um, the BCRG006, there's the uh, three-year three uh, endpoint for that for the anthracycline and the non-anthracycline arm. And then the HERA trial. Um, that Dr. Uh, Picard led uh, that purported. Now, in order to compare apples to apples, because remember in Beth we have more node negative, which you might argue would make the group have a better prognosis overall, we broke it out by the node positive benefit and the node negative benefit, and you see those here. Again, Beth, uh, the TCH backbone performed extremely well uh, by comparison to the anthracycline-based regimens in these large trials. This is cross-trial comparison, so uh, interpret it with all the caveats that come with cross-trial comparisons, but these are large uh, reported clinical trials with, uh, with now published data. Um, the next slide, uh, the last two slides are shown here. This is the uh, thing I think that may be the take home that we can all feel pretty good about. Uh, to the left is the data, uh, that these are published data. Uh, from the Netherlands Cancer Institute in women who had had surgery o alone uh, many, many years ago before adjuvant therapy was used. These tumors were frozen in, the, in the, uh, their tumor bank. They pulled it out when the new molecular techniques came out and applied uh, microarray technology. And you can see that uh, the outcome for the women in terms of disease-free survival is quite different. Dark blue is the highly ERPR positive patients, so-called luminoase. Lighter blue have alterations in the hormone receptors, generally lower PR or other changes in other pathways that affect hormone receptors. The red are the so-called triple negatives. They don't have the HER2 alteration and they do not express high or they're negative for ERPR and don't, ex and don't express high levels if they express it at all. And then in purple are the HER2 positives which have the worst prognosis. Uh, after Bonadonna did his pioneering work that showed adjuvant therapy made a difference, you can see that uh, we improved outcomes a bit for luminal B and luminal A, that although the long-term uh, changes are not very dramatic, uh, and it stays true to form for the HER2 positives and the triple negatives having uh, the worst outcome. The next slide and last slide is sort of the history of where we've been and where we are. Uh, this is not our slide. This is prepared by Carlos Barrio, so I'll give him credit for this sort of overview analysis. But if you click the first time, this is the outcome for patients followed for more than uh, 12 years that were treated with just surgery alone, the old way we used to do it before adjuvant therapy. Um, the disease-free survival uh, was 26% long-term, which means we were having problems with three-quarters of the patients with recurrence or death. The next slide is Bonadonna's work introducing adjuvant therapy, which you know about, that really did improve survival. Uh, but we were treating the disease one size fits all. Uh, they were all getting adjuvant therapy if they were considered to be high risk. Next slide. Uh, the addition of anthracyclines did add about a 3.5% difference. It turns out that there's a subgroup where there's a big difference that pulled the whole group to about 3%. If you identify the subgroup, you would see more with anthracyclines. If you don't have the subgroup, the anthracyclines add no incremental benefit, and that's for about three quarters of human breast cancer where there's no incremental benefit based on the data we've seen. Next slide is the taxanes. 
the single best cytotoxic are the taxanes in terms of the impact they've made on the disease outcome when they were added to the regimens. There are variations on the theme. Next slide's there. Um, so you see what dose dense did. But the final click is what happens when you uh, use a targeted therapy in a defined population. And this is data as far out as we've got follow up. We're out to about seven years now, so it can be updated a bit. But uh, what we had that we reported in the New England Journal in 2011 uh, was 84% at the five year mark. Um, if you go back to the three year mark, it's about 86%, as I showed you at the beginning. Now, with TCH in this large trial, Beth, we're at 92%. So the room for further improvement is getting smaller and smaller. The good news is. If you remember the slide I showed you before versus this, we really changed the natural history of HER2 positive breast cancer with these new targeted therapeutics that, that you've heard about in the past and you're hearing about at the meeting. So I'll end on that and I think it's, it's good news for patients who have this subtype that traditionally had among the worst outcomes uh, with our one size fits all approaches. Great, uh, thank you Dr. Slayman. Questions then? Caroline Hill with Gasco Post. So on the BCIRG trial, which was so important, you, you had a 86% three-year disease-free survival, and here it's 92% with basically the same regimen. How do you explain it being better here? There is only one difference. We've, we've turned the data sets upside down. Uh, you we're pretty comfortable with Beth. We were comfortable with BCRG. That was 1,000 patients in the arm. Beth is, is about 3.2 times bigger um, and this is what we're seeing. I think people are more comfortable with the regimen, so they're able to give it. We're not as worried about uh, when we see something that happens backing off the dose intensities. I also think there was a small difference that we saw in a relative dose intensity, the carbo, in the Beth trial versus what we were able to achieve in 006. So I think that may have contributed, but it's hard to say. But now we have more than 4,000 patients treated in the adjuvant setting, and we certainly do better, um, uh, as well as the anthracycline base are better, and we get rid of some of those safety problems that women have been challenged with. Just to clarify, the percentage of patients that were stage one in Beth versus BCIRG. Sure, uh, the 006 trial also had no negative patients, uh, 30 percent, not 48 percent. So in terms of the overall number, 92 versus the 86, that could help contribute that. But that's why in the table, I broke it out for you by node positive and node negative. So you can compare apples to apples across the trials. The node positive group across all the trials, the node negative group across all the trials. And with that uh, comparison, uh, it's a favorable comparison, I think. Charles Bank. Charles Bankhead. MedPage today. Um, what implications for bevacizumab do you see in these results? I, I think uh, I'm not breaking an embargo because there's already been a press release about the, the ramacirumab trial, which is the M-clone Lilly drug antiangiogenis. Here's the Beth trial. We know about the Sutan trial, uh, the Motesimumab trial. So all of these antiangiogenic strategies have really not impacted survival in breast cancer. So uh, there may still be something there if we really were able to find the right markers, but so far they've all come out negative for any kind of uh, impressive survival advantage, certainly, uh, except for the one trial that showed a progression-free survival didn't result in survival. Um, the challenge in terms of the safety issues is if you're not getting a lot of benefit and you're adding safety concerns, you have to wonder whether it's going to be worthwhile pursuing that much further. Unless there's a new drug or a new strategy to define the subgroup, uh, I, I think this is not going anywhere. Uh, I think we've gotten a pretty good effect with what we have, and we got a very little room at the top uh, to think about new strategies for those patients who aren't getting the benefit that we hope they will with targeted therapy. Further questions then? Suzanne Rose from Cancer Discovery. Is there any reason at this point for um, continued prescription or use of anthracyclines in treatment? 
Um, you would probably be able to fill up a volume of debate uh, if uh, there were other people in the room with me, but um, our own perspective and I think the perspective of a number of people who participated in the trial and 006 is the answer is no. There is no single trial that I'm aware of that ever showed there was an incremental benefit with the anthracyclines. It really came from the Oxford Overview where multiple trials were put together in a meta-analysis. And there it was a three to three and a half percent improvement in d disease free survival and about a four percent but uh, improvement in overall survival. Now we were all trained to use it because of the meta-analysis, our own group the, the same. The only reason we tried to do something different with the uh, trastuzumab when it came online is the only real safety signal we saw was the uh, increased left ventricular function and congestive heart failure. It increased by fourfold uh, when you added those two together. And that is not just our finding, that was findings across no a number of trials. Um, but I think there's no reason to take that risk now that we have more than 4,000 patients treated with between BCRG006 and uh, Beth that show that this is a pretty favorable outcome. So we at our institution do not use these drugs. It doesn't mean they're not effective, they just don't pr provide any incremental benefit over other drugs that would give you the same effect without the safety concerns. And I agree with Dr. Slayman that we could spend the next five hours here debating and I'm clearly on the other side of the aisle that, that we shouldn't say that all anthracycline should go away. Um, and I think it's very important for us to understand that the Beth trial specifically asked the question, does bevacizumab add anything? And the answer quite clearly is no. It does not answer the question or should compare the arms between an anthracycline and a non-anthracycline containing arm. That was not the design or intent. Um, but again, this continues to go on ongoing debate at this point that I don't think that we will be able to resolve in today's press conference. I, I will add that we had hoped to have more anthracycline treated patients in Beth. We allowed for that and the sites that were given the option um, where we were pretty assured that they, they were going to prospectively select it, it turns out did not, which was a surprise which is why we only ended up with 300 patients, which is a very small number for a comparison. But we have the data, I've shared it with you, you interpret it as you will. We can hear you. Absolutely, thank you. So I think this is an exceptionally well-run study by Dr. Slayman and his colleagues specifically asking the question, which has been really ongoing for the several, several years, whether or not the anti-angiogenesis, or specifically in this case bevacizumab, is going to add anything to the current treatment strategies. And I feel that Dr. Slayman and his group have definitively answered this in the HER2 question, that bevacizumab adds really significant toxicity and no benefit. Why do you feel that you're on the other side of the aisle given the uh, unknown? I'd like to know that because I've heard other doctors tell me it's preferable if it's not an anthracycline. So, so there's several reasons. Yes, we can show in different studies about anthracycline and non-anthracycline. If we go back to BCIR G006, and Dr. Slayman, please correct me if I'm wrong about this. That randomization was not between the anthracycline and not anthracycline containing arms. That was between the uh, Herceptin versus non Herceptin containing arms. I think, and I do use TCH in several instances for patients, but I don't think we should throw away anthracyclines. I think Beth is also a good sh uh, show potentially why almost 50% of the patients who participated in Beth were stage one and that is different than what we're seeing in other trials. That also makes me question, was there a selection bias of who put people on TCH versus not um, for them to have a higher rate of stage one? But I do feel that the uh, Herceptin story and the combination stories to come, uh, we heard a little bit from Dr. Picard this morning, I think pertuzumab and the uh, TDM1 uh, coming through is going to really also be a landscape changer in HER2 disease. I also agree with Dr. Slayman 
that ERPR negative HER2 positive breast cancer is drastically different than hormone receptor positive breast cancer, and we're going to be uh, continuing to find specific strategies and not a one therapy fits all for all HER2 disease. As we're learning more and more about the molecular subsets of cancer, how we've broken them up into triple receptors is really going to go uh, by the wayside. Everything I just said can, pertains to HER2 at this point. Yes. So, so I would agree with Dr. Litton that was 006 was not designed to ask the question that we had an anthracycline arm, we had a non-anthracycline arm, but it was Herceptin added to against an anthracycline uh, taxane control arm, and there both arms were superior. There was a numerical inferiority of, of the actual non-anthracycline arm was not statistically significant, and there was more, as we anticipated, congestive heart failure. Uh, about five times more. So the number of events you had in advantage of the anthracyclines was almost equal to the number of congestive heart failures and leukemias you had with the regimen. Um, the debate continues, and I suspect will continue for some time. I think we should move past it. But the challenge is, uh, unless I've not read the literature collect correctly, there is not a single trial where anthracyclines have been compared to non-anthracyclines uh, in general breast cancer that has showed there's an incremental benefit. It's the meta-analysis that showed it. Uh, and it's the subgroups with molecular testing that showed that there may be a group that has a huge benefit. Interestingly enough, it's the HER2 group, and that may be because of other alterations that occur in the amplicon. Uh, but, but in terms of single data, there are trials that have been run looking at uh, things like uh, CEF versus CMF, uh, the uh, trial that was run by Dr. Pritchard, the MA5 trial, and in fact, there's there outside that subgroup that we talked about, there is no difference, uh, and I can't find a trial that reports a difference that shows an incremental benefit of the anthracyclines. I agree with Dr. Litton. That is not saying they're not effective chemotherapeutic drugs, but they're not more chemo effective than other drugs that we can use that don't give the safety signal, which is why we're on our side of this argument. Uh, whether there's a right or wrong side is unknown. Thank you. And that, that question and comment, because we are out of time, on behalf of the sponsors of the San Antonio